Michael. I'm president of the branch. Excuse me, we've started. <laughs> the AAA has been an active uh, participant in the debate on the rules-based order, the RBO we'll call it. The Institute organised a major conference on the subject here in Canberra three years ago. Various guest speakers have touched on it and there's been regular commentary in the Australian outlook. So there's been a variety of views expressed so far, whether the US inspired RBO is fatally flawed because of its association with liberal democracy, global consensus, and the end of nationalism. And to what degree the RBO has failed to align with the values and interests of certain emerging powers. Our speaker tonight will continue the debate by posing his own compelling questions. How important are the perspective of Australia's neighbours in efforts to help shape our strategic environment? And does Australia have the wherewithal to make a creative contribution in the international rules setting? To lead the discussion, we're most fortunate to have with us International Director of Asia Link, Emeritus Professor Anthony Milner. Tony is a long-standing commentator on Australia-Asia issues with a wealth of experience in building Australia-Asia dialogues. As an Asia specialist, his particular focus has been on Malaysia, Indonesia, and ASEAN. Tony's academic appointments, including Basham Professor of Asian History at the ANU in 1994, later Dean of Asian Studies. He was, has been a professorial fellow at the, Un the University of Melbourne since 2006, and an editor of the Asian Studies Review for the Asian Studies Association of Australia. Uh, there are numerous publications, a three volume study of Australia-Asia relations and books, many of them, on articles on Malay history. Tony served on the Foreign Affairs Council set up by Alexander Downer in the late 1990s and later on the Australia-Thailand and Australia-Malaysia Institutes. These days, uh, with another fellow branch member, Rick Smith, who's with us here tonight, I think, Tony is working on a study for the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia-Pacific on Indo uh, Pacific perspectives on the RBO. And you can read all about it in an article they've written in the Fin Review on 30 April. Tony became a member of the Order of Australia in 2007. And we have our fellows award, don't we? And uh, while I'm on the topic of awards, I want to take uh, this opportunity <laughs> to hand him his AIIA. Fellows Award in recognition of his long-standing contribution to Australia relations. It'll just, just be with us. I'm particularly pleased to be able to perform this duty as we're both uh, uh, presidents, uh, in Tony's case, of course, formerly of the ACT branch of the AIIA. And as we're discovering, uh, both went to the same school in Melbourne. <laughs> Different times. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll uh, pass that pass that to award to Tony shortly. Um, in the meantime, um, if I could uh, ask Tony to begin his comments. Thank you, and I, I didn't know we were having that element. That's that's very pleasant. Thank you, that's generous. Um, <clears throat> the international order, then, the rules and arrangements that uh, guide the way nations interact with one another, the rules-based order. We've been focused on this in Australia. Look at the speeches from our Prime Minister and Foreign Minister. United States rules-based order was recently described as one of the Biden administration's favorite terms. But let's go back a little in time 20 years ago to the uh, American neoconservative Robert Kagan, who teased the Europeans about rules. Europeans, he said, were preoccupied with international rules. And that was because Europe, he said, was spent, unserious, and weak. America, by contrast, he said, had real power. It was a sheriff in an unruly Hobbesian world. Well, that was two decades ago when the United States confidence was high, and today we're all, including the United States, talking about rules. And the liveliness of this talk must be an indication of just how unsettled the international scene has become. Lots of rules, of course, are relatively non-controversial. Rules regulating international banking or the aviation industry, for instance. When we speak of the rules based international order, however, we tend to mean something more ambitious. We're referring to the international system. Henry Kissinger has called the reconstruction 
of the international system, the ultimate challenge to statesmanship of our time. Now, this Institute of International Affairs had a useful conference years ago, and conferences about to appear, I understand, in the opening conference, they said, President explained the rules of the basic order, weaves together organizations, laws, rules, principles, and procedures. The order also exists inside a structure of power. The current order is American led, operating since the end of World War II. The origins of this current order, as we go back to centuries. But it was the Atlantic Charter of 1941, he says, that spelt out its shape and purpose with the stress on self determination, economic cooperation disarmament, and so forth. The creation of the United Nations was critical in the building of the post-war order. Financial institutions emerging from the Bretton Woods Conference were another key element. Apart from these general observations, the conference, the Institute Conference, looked hard at Australia's contributions to the current order. For instance, uh, our part in building the United Nations, in particular, the way we uh, rep where our representatives acted as brokers, advocating the case for smaller nations, stressing, for instance, the authority of the General Assembly vis-a-vis -vis the Elite Security Council. Other Australian contributions included work on the Antarctic Treaty and arms proliferation, the Cairns Group, the Bali process, and so forth. Looking through the list, uh, it creates some pride. Uh, but one aspect of Australia's uh, um, involvement in the current order got only passing reference in the Institute Conference, and that is our geopolitical and what might be called our civilizational positioning. It was certainly made clear that Australia has approached the international order from a Western liberal perspective, stressing such values as political, economic, and religious freedom. We've sometimes talked explicitly, in fact, about the liberal rules-based order. To recognize Australia's own liberal heritage is one matter, but there are obvious reasons to take seriously perspectives from the Asian region. Not only does geography demand this and our economic dependence on the region as well, but any thinking about, um, about international order today must take account of the great shift in economic and political power from the North Atlantic to the Pacific. Now, to get at Asian perspectives on the international order, the Council for Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific, CSCAP, a track two regional security network in which Australia is an active player, with the assistance of AsiaLink at the University of Melbourne, has been carrying out surveys and commissioning expert commentaries from regional think tanks. Engaging in this research, Australia's CSCAP committee was encouraged by Australia's 2017 foreign policy white paper. As the CSCAP co-chair Rick Smith pointed out in the Lowy Institute's interpreter, this white paper contains the tantalizing comment that the rules and forms of international cooperation have to evolve, and in doing so, they need to accommodate the greater weight of emerging powers. Now, more recently, Foreign Minister Payne has repeated this point, stressing that Australia must also, uh, must also be serious, uh, clear about our values and our core interests. There is recognition here that Australia has now an opportunity to engage in international deliberation of both geostrategic and civilizational significance. The CSCAP research, I should say, is far from completed. A, a critical meeting scheduled to be in Vietnam had to be postponed because of COVID. But anyway, what have we learned so far about regional perspectives? Well, first, the good news coming from the CSCAP surveys and commentaries is that there is wide support for some type of international rules system. Commenting on the security area, a Chinese analyst stresses the need to deliver predictability to avoid dangerous surprise. A Vietnamese author notes the need for a shared commitment to countries conducting their interaction in accordance with agreed rules and principles. Now, the second message from the CSCAP inquiry is that the current rules system needs a thorough rethink, particularly to make it more inclusive. Although the Institute Conference certainly noted the American and liberal underpinning of the rules-based order, the CSCAP commentary stressed this far more strongly and often negatively. 
A Vietnamese contribution, for instance, notes the influence of liberal and international beliefs shared among Western political elites and designed to counter challenges from socialist countries. A Singaporean perspective is that the post-war powers held a privileged position and instituted rules that helped them to define the terms in ways that suited their interests. One theme in the commentaries is hypocrisy. In the words of a Philippines analyst, America has repeatedly violated its own principles. For instance, in the American refusal to ratify the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Although the commentaries repeat the argument, China and other Asian states have risen greatly with respect to the West, giving them a right to influence the rules. A third message from these commentaries is that the smaller or middle powers have a special role to play in a revision process. Suspicion is expressed not only toward the US, but to all great states. A Vietnamese analyst accuses both of today's great powers uh, of undermining the global order by flouting existing rules and withdrawing from or abusing multilateral institutions and paralyzing international cooperation. By contrast, according to a Philippines analyst, smaller states have a distinct interest in becoming stabilizers and legitimizers of the world order. Such comments lend support to our foreign minister's suggestion that Australia, as a middle power, might contribute to the evolution of the rules. It also so happens that a 2017 essay from a Singapore analyst and a Japanese analyst explicitly supported the idea of Australia acting as a broker, as they put it, engaging with China and other Asian countries to find common ground for the development of a rules-based order in the Pacific. What, however, might be involved in rethinking the rules? The fourth message from the CSCAP commentaries is that there are real differences in perspective that will need to be negotiated. Now, let me give a few examples. One type of difference is that of emphasis. For instance, a Singapore commentary notes that China and Singapore tend to value economic elements in the rules order, but are less comfortable with political and security aspects. Modi's India, by contrast, is ambivalent about the trade economic aspects. Turning to differences about rule substance, the commentaries and other inquiries made by CSCAP and AsiaLink raise such issues as the following. How far should there be an expansive interpretation of rights of navigation as against the security concerns of neighboring states? What importance should be given to historical rights, for instance, in the South China Sea contests, and how can these rights be demonstrated? We noted as well the differences with respect to handling of commercial and other disputes. How far should these be dealt with on the basis of written rules? How far through extended negotiation? On the matter of norms, our inquiries noticed a preference in ASEAN against discriminating on the basis of the country's internal political system. A preference that helps to explain why the original ASEAN states saw no objection to reaching out to Vietnam and other communist states at the end of the Cold War. Another ASEAN example is a norm stressing inclusiveness rather than adversarial strategies, a norm that adds to ASEAN's suspicion regarding the Quad security dialogue of four self-described democracies, the Quad, which is viewed as antagonistic by China. The approach to rising powers in some ASEAN circles was also noted with obvious reference to China. As one Malaysian commentator put it, the ASEAN preference is for ceding space at the table for such states. The ASEAN perspective, however, is far from passive. The norm seems to be to acknowledge the superior, superiority of a major state and then to engage closely with that state, building a relationship, drawing the larger state into regional practices and gaining as much as possible from that hierarchical relationship. In this spirit, a few weeks ago, Prime Minister Lee of Singapore advised our Prime Minister that you need to work with China. It is going to be there. It is going to be a substantial presence. Lee admitted that there would be rough spots in the China relationship, but these should be dealt with, he said, as issues in a partnership which you want to keep going. On its part, Malaysia has also respected the paramount role of China. It has sought not so much to resist the growing power as to enmesh China in one way or another in the region. 
Malaysia has its disputes with China, but it also recognizes the material and other benefits of the relationship. When Prime Minister Mahathir went to China in 2018, he had a provocative message to deliver. He wanted to renegotiate large contracts, but Mahathir laid stress on Malaysia being a small country to negotiate with a big, coming to negotiate with a big and powerful state with which Malaysia had respectful relations over a very long period. Mahathir negotiated hard and some commentators in the West, guided by a balance of power calculations, predicted he would take Malaysia towards some form of anti-China alliance. They were wrong. He argued with China, but without questioning the regional hierarchy. Before leaving the subject of difference in perspectives, let me say something specific about the foundational concept, the foundational concept of sovereignty. Discussions with Chinese and other regional commentators have given indications that the Chinese term Zhuquan, forgive my pronunciation, is not quite the same meaning as the English sovereignty. Zhuquan seems less focused on territorial borders and also conveys a specific concern about face or dignity or respect. The different shades of meaning may be influenced by pre-modern foreign relations thinking. The topic raises the question, for instance, of whether China is claiming ownership of the South China Sea, as some Western commentators have suggested, or something rather more loose. What exactly do those dashed lines mean in the South China Sea? How sovereignty is viewed in Southeast Asia has also been discussed in our inquiries. Malaysia even has a holiday resort on Layang Layang in the Spratly Islands, but seems relatively relaxed that China also claims this place. In the case of Malaysia's maritime border with Thailand, this has still not been settled, yet the two countries are able to cooperate together to create a joint development zone in the disputed region. What is happening in these maritime developments? Are Southeast Asian states comparatively tolerant of what might be seen as overlapping sovereign sovereignty, as well as being more comfortable than some about the policing of borders? Now, noticing these genuine differences of perspective regarding rules and norms, differences that will need to be dealt with in a revision process, how should we proceed? In particular, how might Australia as a middle power move forward? Well, the CSCAP commentaries give some practical advice. They suggest that deliberation might first take place at track two level in regional networks that are one removed from government. The advice too, they advise too that in the words of a Chinese analyst, that it's uh, best to be satisfied with a workable degree of order and not operate on the assumption that one size should fit all. Such practical advice is welcome, but looking at the contrasting perspectives on international rules, the real challenge is likely to be handling disagreement over foundational principles. Here we find the civilization dimension of the task of rules division, revision. In his book, World Order, Kissinger has warned that the aim must be to translate divergent cultures into a common system and to do so knowing the values that we seek to advance. The Institute's conference certainly identified values which matter to Australians. And it's also true that Australia has an impressive track record in developing liberal ideas. As Tim Rouse and David Kemp, in their different ways, have explained, Australia is recognised as an almost uniquely successful fragment of European liberalism. Australia's particular history, therefore, gives authority to our engagement in rulemaking. But we also must know about the way the rules-based order was introduced into our region of the world. Revising rules today will involve looking back as well as forward. Now, anyone sceptical about the significance of history should note the energy and the passion being injected today into debate about European First Nations encounters in this country two centuries ago. In the Asian region, Europeans who visited, for instance, in the 18th and 19th century, encountered a specific Asian order. They noted common diplomatic practice, as they put it, to the eastward of Hindustan. Although often treated with courtesy, these Europeans were often frustrated, having to deal with monarchies, ruler-centered polities, possessing no clear territorial boundaries. Monarchies related to one another in elaborate hierarchies, represented in tedious ceremony and reinforced by mercantilist economic policies. European diplomats had no continuing state entities to deal with 
treaties and other agreements could only be made with monarchs and one monarch who didn't need to respect the agreements of his predecessor. Trading relations and border relations with these monarchies was often challenging. The way Western states brought about changes in this Asian order, the ideological and sometimes physical violence is likely to be a topic of growing interest and one highlighted when the pre-World War II origins of the rules-based order are discussed. European envoys were determined to change the Asian order, insisting on what they called principles of civilized nations. They wanted to deal not just with individual monarchs, but with state entities, bureaucratic states with orderly borders, states which would adhere to written agreements, even beyond the change in monarch. The then powerful Westerners, with their gunboats at the ready, sought to cut through the frameworks of hierarchy, talking of equality and reciprocity. They wanted to free up trade, ending the royal monopolies and regulations. The state and the interstate system, which the Westerners demanded in the 19th century, continues to underpin the order that America introduced and endorsed in, after the Second World War. Discussion about these radical forced transformations will spark emotions, and they also will stimulate interest in the pre-Western foreign relations. Australians seeking to engage today in the evolution of the rules would do well to know the history of ideological contest in Asia, and also learn about the old Asian order itself. Considering how old norms and rules might still be influential today is one question. How they might become a reference point in reforming the current system is another. The pre-Western system interests me, but this evening I can't do more than indicate the direction in which research is moving. One starting point for exploring the old order is the foundation principle of sovereignty. Post-Westphalian, post-17th century sovereignty. The concept that carries assumptions about absolute and perpetual authority over a specific defined territory and assumptions about formal equality in the world of state acting. Already noted indications that the Chinese idea of sovereignty is today not quite the same as the usual Western idea and may be shaped to some extent by earlier Chinese thinking. If we turn to the rules order in pre-Western Southeast Asia, and I'll concentrate here on the Malay world, which I know best, the search for foundational concepts relating in some way to sovereignty may also be of benefit. Like most of the Asian region, the Malay world was a collection of monarchies, political units, if you like, defined by their sentence. This emerges clearly in the often exasperated accounts by Europeans. It's in the indigenous writings, however, the Malay writings, however, that we get a deeper understanding of how these monarchies <laughs> operated. For instance, um, ceremony, ceremony, so these writings convey, was not frivolous. Ceremony, not territorial location, incorporated subjects in a monarchy and defined the hierarchical relations between one monarchy and another. Hierarchies both within and between monarchs, according to Malay writings, were not static. The quest for status was a constant driver. Hierarchies were also not necessarily viewed negatively. They offered opportunities, opportunities for status advancement. A great monarchy, a great power, a rising power did not automatically provoke resistance. It was not automatically rallied against, balanced against. The norm was rather to engage or embrace the greater power to forge bonds with that power and to obtain as much benefit as possible from those bonds. Malay writings suggest how Malay rulers did this with respect to the Emperor of China, the King of Siam and the rising European power, the Dutch East India Company. A good deal of pre-modern Malay writing is about the strategies the small guy can employ to gain from the big ruler. Present here is the idea of a wily mouse deer the small animal who finds ways to achieve advantage over larger animals in the jungle. What I cannot find in the pre-modern Malay text is the principle of sovereignty, the notion of sovereign equality and the assumption that a ruler has sovereign authority over a defined area of land. What we do encounter, however, is the norm of non-intervention, 
Although hierarchy was not a problem, there was a strong injunction against interfering in a subordinate monarchy's internal affairs, not so much in the ruler's territory as his internal arrangements or his customs, his adat. Non-intervention, not sovereignty, was the powerful norm. To admit inferiority was one matter, to accept intervention was another. Now, reviewing some of the foundational principles in the old Malay order, monarchs, not states, centers, not borders, hierarchy, not equality, and the quest for status, engage, not balance against, non-intervention, not sovereignty, taking account of such norms helps us to understand the frustrations of European negotiators. Border relations were bound to be difficult, and we have accounts of rulers unable to answer the question, where does your territory end? The intricacies and the rituals of the hierarchy were just not just tedious, but complicated the task of freeing up trade. Now, thinking about the elements in the old Malay order, it was certainly possible to see signs of its continuing influence today. Although the Malayan, Malaysian leadership speaks now in the language of uh, current international relations, highlighting, for instance, the principle of sovereignty, I've noted that it is relatively relaxed about border disputes. The Malaysians are also comfortable referring to their country as small and addressing China as a superior power. And they seem reluctant to rally against, to join alliances against that power. Although relatively accepting of hierarchy, Malaysia in modern terms also continues to resist interference in its internal affairs. And as we've seen, respects the rights of other states to maintain their own political systems. In handling hierarchical relations, Malaysians in modern times also continue to value Mouse skills. While admitting they are a small country, their leaders express pride in being deft and nimble, as one prime minister said. I think we can recognize such mouse skills in the way Prime Minister Mahathir traveled to China in 2018, acknowledging its superior status while negotiating with real determination. Now, there's no time to take this investigation any further, but I hope the point is clear. Although key norms from the Western order have taken root in Asia, they are sometimes shadowed by, shadowed by norms from the past. Not long ago, the Singapore diplomat, Bilahari Kausikan, suggested that there has been a, a melding of Westphalian diplomatic practice with ancient Chinese statecraft in the Asian region. A Japanese scholar has referred to fusing of old and new political concepts in the so-called modernization process. And I think, I think we can see this melding and fusing taking place in the Malaysian case. Now, our remaining question is whether in revising the current uh, international rules, Australians and others might take into account indigenous Asian thinking. For instance, about hierarchical diplomacy or modified sovereignty. Might such perspectives help to maintain peace in this time of deep running transition? Including now, concluding now, however, we might recall that deliberation and dialogue can itself promote a form of order. Now, although Western analysts have sometimes denigrated ASEAN institutions as mere talk shops, it's worth taking account of real achievements of ASEAN regionalism of the ASEAN conversation. For Australia, I, I suppose, the question is whether we wish to be a part of the conversation of the region or stand outside in this turbulent time. When we look back over the last two centuries of ideological history in Asia, liberal ideas, the ideas we value, have made genuine progress, often through adaptation, melding, and fusing. And Australia, with its long history of liberalism, and with its diplomatic and academic experience in Asia, has what it takes, I think, to contribute to the evolution of the rules-based order. And in so doing, we've got a chance to influence our strategic environment. Very good. Thank you. Well, thanks so much, Tony. There's uh, plenty of material there for questions mm -hmm. and others. Um, so can I open it to the floor of anybody for a question for uh, Anthony? Yes, Bill. I don't know whether the microphone, but uh, I think we can hear you. That's good. Uh, Speak up uh, and let us know who you are. Uh, William Bain. Uh, 
Honey, I was yeah. very interested in the comments you made towards the end of your presentation about uh, borders as opposed to uh, spheres of authority uh, in um, Asia, because there's an argument to the effect that that was really typical of large tracts of Europe until the late 19th century when European monarchs did have demarcated authority but lacked the bureaucratic capacity to control borders in a rigorous fashion. And you could really travel the world if you had the money until the First World War without a passport. So in a sense, I wonder whether the disjuncture is that great or whether uh, the, the rulers whom you mentioned in, in uh, Asia uh, were actually capturing something that was really central to the Westphalia in order until the preoccupation with firm borders came relatively recently in European history. Yeah, it's just, if you take uh, Thailand, for instance, the 19th century, it's probably a good example, isn't it? The, yeah. the uh, figure with which they sort of reinvented themselves as a, as a bordered state of Siam, pressing their central Thai ethnicity. Um, James may have thoughts on that, but that, um, Japan, I suppose, too, the, the creation of modern Japan following the, the Meiji Restoration. Um, but this, uh, I mean, it's going on in Europe, but it's uh, it's picked up. The, the Japanese, of course, as you know, also sort of sent their sent people to uh, Germany and England to learn everything they could about creating a nation state. The Thais had the same. The, the people in sultans in the Malay world were doing the same thing. People who were once just monarchies made themselves kings of a thing called a state, whether it was the state of Johor or the state of uh, Siam or whatever. Uh, but that entity, that separate ongoing entity going beyond the king, the territory was defined <coughs> with policed borders, whatever, is something that's being put into place very much in the 19th century. And as you say, it was something flowing from... Uh, uh, People talk about the Westphalian thing as though that was just a turning point. I understand from specialists in European history, it's just an, as you were saying, it's an ongoing process in Europe. Which, which, hmm. Any other questions? Yes, James. James Wise. Um, just on the, the time, before the colonial powers moved into that part of the world, Thai monarchs went to war <coughs> Um, not to claim territory at all. There was an ample territory for everybody. There was a shortage of people. Mm. They went to war to gain treasure and to gain people mm. and to protect your dignity if you thought your dignity was being offended in some way. There was no notion at all that you went to war for territory. That idea of territory, as you said, came <coughs> with the British. But it lingers in Thailand too. Thailand has a border with Burma. I think it's about two and a half thousand kilometers. 58 kilometers are demarcated. 58 out of two and a half thousand. And it doesn't seem to worry the Thais or the Burmese. Um, so it doesn't mean there's not conflicts at times when refugees came across and things happen on the border. But again, there's, the idea that you actually demarcate the border doesn't raise in their priorities at all. Yeah, I remember the Sultan of Perak telling me. A couple of years ago, they still hadn't sorted out their borders with, with uh, Thailand. Um, they, they have now. It, that, that border settled, but, but, um, but the, the border with Laos wasn't settled for a long time. The, um, there's a nice account of the... Um, this is good, we're having some history. There's a nice account of the Dutch going to war with the Portuguese and the Portuguese got Malacca and the Dutch and the Malays, the Sultan of Johor, are allies in this battle. And the first problem was that the Malays didn't want to fight. They said, we'll sit there and watch while you fight. <laughs> uh, but we'll grab anybody we can to escape. So we'll take them home as slaves, right? That was the thing. Uh, but but then they, the Dutch said, well, we'll divide up. We, we'll, we'll take the city and you can have all the land when we win this battle, which they didn't win. We, that, that's how we're divided up. And the Sultan said, what in, what in heaven's name would I want the land for? <laughs> no interest at all. <laughs> so it fits your point very, very well. We're after people. We're after people. And they did that in all those wars, Thailand, Burma, whatever, grabbing people, settled them, and changed them. That, that was a comment, but just a question I had moving into completely different territory. In the responses from your colleagues in the Seascape network in the region, <coughs> um, did any of them mention at all uh, the question of UN reform? Um, and in looking at a new international order, 
the fact that obviously Japan and India and even Indonesia um, are not sort of able to play the role internationally that they might believe that their status warrants because of the way the post World War II uh, UN system is structured, the Security Council, isn't it? We, I can't remember any of them actually writing about that. The conversations around the region, we hear this quite a lot, don't we? And that's a, so, so certainly that's that's in the air, and we're hearing those comments. I can't think of any of the commentaries that actually raise that, perhaps because they take it for granted. Mm. Mm. Tony, you've mentioned already uh, uh, Malaysia and uh, Thailand, uh, but what about some of the other ASEAN partners, uh, uh, particularly Indonesia and uh, the Philippines. Uh, it must be very difficult to get in your study a, a compact view from all the ASEAN partnerships. I mean, Indonesia's uh, probably not uh, too aligned with the uh, mouse deer diplomacy view of uh, sovereignty. I mean, uh, how, how are you able to come to a conclusion about um, sort of ASEAN's view? Well, I think... Um, um, I think that one 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 uh, paper I was taking from was speaking more broadly for ASEAN, and from my experience, it was it was quite it was quite useful. I mean, just look at the ASEAN uh, outlook outlook on the Indo Pacific. That's that's an interesting document. Mm -hmm. um, it, it fits with this. They're uncomfortable about uh, anything being non inclusive. Uh, they don't want to be seen to be ganging up on China. And that seems to be more general than just Malaysia and a couple of others. Uh, they want to be seen as ganging up on China. They want to form alliances. Uh, they want an inclusive system. They're respecting, mm -hmm. comes through too, a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. I think those comments from Prime Minister Lee are quite useful. Mm -hmm. and I didn't, didn't get much comment in our press here, but uh, he, he was therefore you know, giving advice to the Australian Prime Minister. It's very direct, you think, quite controversial advice at the time. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think I, th I mean, I think that I'm particularly talking about Malaysia because I know that best. But it's, uh, I think it's more general than that. I think talking to Thai diplomats, I think this is the same tendency. Mm. The Koreans, mm. all right. Also, mm. uh, yes, Desmond. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, I was intrigued by your um, distinction between our concept of sovereignty and the Chinese translation of it. And looking ahead to our next presentation, which is indeed on the South China Sea, when we're at Port Goldring, uh, I've always been somewhat mystified by the standard statement that emanates from the um, islands, the artificial islands, when one of our aircraft strays within the 12 nautical mile mm -hmm. zone. The statement that comes is that you know you must you must uh, vacate the area uh, for a lot of reasons, including the fact that you are hurting the feelings of the Chinese people. <laughs> It's a very odd remark from a Western perspective, not the sort of thing we would ever say, but perhaps you can shed some light on it by saying what that is a mistranslation of. Is it to do with uh, the very things you were talking about, which is respect and the sense of self and the assertion of entitlements? Uh, I take the view that the Chinese enthusiasm for land-based sovereignty in the South China Seas is a recognition that ship-based sovereignty comes and goes. Whereas if you are a land power with thousands of years of knowing that sovereignty is where you've got your troops on the great border, maybe that's of excessive importance to you. Your thoughts? Um, well, I'm, I'm not a China specialist, but I, I spent quite a bit of time uh, each year until COVID in Kuala Lumpur and the Chinese Studies Center there was very good in terms of bringing prominent Chinese specialists from China there. Um, and so we, we talked quite a lot about, uh, uh, about the issue of sovereignty. And I suppose I'm getting it from those conversations um, and also from a project that the ANU had looking at the language of security a few years ago and the analysis of sovereignty in that, in that project. Um, when I talked with the man in charge of ASEAN's relationship with China in Jakarta once, uh, he, his comments fitted very well with what you've just said. He said, I, I feel more and more, he told me, that 
and he wasn't Chinese. When the Chinese talk about sovereignty in the South China Sea, they're really referring to something more of like respect. Um, um, it's, it's interesting to drill down into that, isn't it? Uh, there seems to be, I, I had the feeling more flexibility in this than we would have if we were talking about our sovereignty over a particular area. So yes, I think the thing about hurting the feelings of Chinese people fits with that quite well. Mm -hmm. Difficult for us to take seriously when it's put like that. Unless you know what that really means. Yeah, yeah. but it does fit with that, what that guy was saying in, in, in Jakarta. and He was dealing with the Chinese all the time. Hmm. Well, I've got a question from Richard and then Rod, okay. Yeah. Um, Richard Matthews, I mean, um, I was intrigued by your analysis of the old Asian order and whether that's still how it still influences thinking in the region. And um, of course, in the old Asian order, um, trade was pretty important as well. Mm -hmm. You know, the Portuguese took Malacca in 1511 and took control of the, that as a trading entrepôt. The Malay traders moved all over the place. Many moved to Makassar, which then was a trading entrepôt until the Dutch took it in the 17th, late 17th century. And then, tr so trade was always a part of that scene as well. How much do you think trade is uh, sort of uh, trade links, trade channels, uh, so a much part of the uh, old, the new Asian order today? And how does that influence thinking? And referring back to Desmond's uh, question too, there's a word in my mind referring to what you were talking about, suzerainty. Hmm. Um, that in the old, in, in descriptions of old China and its relations with Southeast Asia, we often hear of the trips that great monarchs would make to, or would, they would send tribute to China, basically. And, and that's how you get, that's one of the ways, one of the mechanisms of keeping order in the region. And, um, it is, you know, is suzerainty a word that's useful to help understand modern China and Southeast Asia? So two questions there, trade and, and then sovereignty. Well, the, the uh, I suppose how is, uh, how is trade perceived as an end in itself? I mean, it's, it's quite interesting from a Malay point of view that the uh, uh, money has no meaning unless it's uh, plugged into a, what we would see as a status system. Now, one famous character in a Malay text says, you know, I've got plenty of money, but it has no meaning. We need a Raja in our country. Would you come and rule it? Because once we've got a Raja, I can put meaning in my life. Now, I mean, that's a royal text, but it tells you something about how that royalty views that. Uh, so I think it's a danger in seeing trade as an end in itself. Getting money, getting subjects. I mean, you know, you needed, you needed resources for the ceremonies and all else that you did to, to hold subjects. And rulers competed with one another as uh, James said, to get subjects, Burmese rulers versus Thai rulers and Malay rulers and so forth. There really was a competition for subjects. Um, so subjects trade part of that, it seems to me, uh, but you were judged by the number of people you had around you, I think. So the wealth was, the wealth was important, but in gaining people, it was the object. What's the second half of your question? Was, Suzerainty and the way that old, yeah. old kingdoms used to deal with China. Yeah. But that, it's weird, isn't it, when you read about it? Again, the, the emphasis is very much on status, isn't it? On that, that, what almost seems a spiritual status and that the Chinese want to have their, is the word de, de, confirmed. It's a, a sort of dignity, status, spiritual worth or whatever. So you've got to, you've got to uh, deal with the Chinese hierarchically your trading is portrayed, your visits are portrayed in terms of hierarchy, and the Chinese leaders, de, I think that's the word, T, is, is, uh, is, is confirmed in this process. But so also are the Southeast Asian rulers. They also, they have words in different countries for it, and the Malay word is, is Nama, the, 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 the status, you're gaining your status, one ruler out against another competing. Everybody's in this mobile hierarchy, it seems to me, but to, to us, we would say it's objectionable to have somebody above you and you need to be ultimately sovereign in your own area. But in fact, that would withdraw you from the game and the game is to be there and to use your relationships with the one above you to raise, rise yourself above the one competing with you over here and so forth. This is a very dynamic structure uh, in that pre-modern world. So you wonder whether some of that 
passes over today and the comment we heard about what the how the Chinese see their position in the South China Sea may be an example of that. Uh, certainly there are comments from Southeast Asian leaders that fit with that view, that there's some older system, just like Bilahari Kausikin says, an older system um, uh, for somehow uh, uh, mixed with what's going on in terms of a modern state-to-state -state, um, uh, international system. So what, what shadows the current situation? Why do people, why do the Malaysians respond so differently as a middle power, more or less, to the way we respond to things? Um, are, there, are there not just material interests, but old ideas hovering around? Okay, Rod? Uh, Rod, Rod Holsgrove, I uh, uh, strongly believe, I think, by many, that the, the real, real place in that world is more important than ever in this with the range of global threats uh, and also, I've also always believed Australia's strong middle power and has, as you, as you illustrated, has played a really important role in a range of areas. I'm interested particularly on you know, climate change and biodiversity loss in the sea, oceans, for example. But it seems to me, you know, we're also fairly well known, I suppose, it's a, sort of an ideological issue politically in Australia, whether it's on the left or the right, and uh, Labor prides itself more on its... You know, and, involved in multilateral issues while the coalition tends not to we remember mr morrison's famous statement last year about international bureaucrats i can't quite remember what he said exactly but <coughs> he was playing negative <laughs> 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 and then we've got a, you know of course another uh, important issue in, in that has been the decline of the NAC, especially with under trump and now we've got the experience of covid uh, and it's sort of worked a bit but not perhaps like it should be. I guess my question is, uh, Australia, you know, so as, as believing Australia can play a strong, you know, with its links with China and Asian these countries and regions we talk about, what is your opinion? Can we rise to the occasion again? Are we, is it an uphill battle for the world and for Australia or? Well, you gathered, I think that we, we I've read a bit about us in the, uh, United Nations, partly because my father-in-law was involved in that, used to talk about it. Um, but we played something of a broker role there, it seems to me, between larger and smaller countries. Mm -hmm. There's an issue now as what whether we can play some sort of broker role between those who are writing responses to those sea scout uh, mm -hmm. requests uh, and defenders of the liberal order. Um, seems to me there will be a conversation go on about this and it would be uh in the asean spirit it may be a conversation that promotes dialogue between us all and some sort of unity mm. uh but you'll see that i'm worried that we think it's enough in some cases really i think some people think it's enough that we know something about the liberal order and their own liberal background whereas we actually need to know a lot more about the asian region mm. I don't know what your households are like, but the discussion that came out about dark emu uh, recently brought home to me that history isn't dead after all. Uh, there is much, much passion about this topic on various sides. Um, and there's passion in the region about their own history in the Asian region. So I suppose in this, these brief comments, I'm trying to say we're going to have to take knowledge of the Asian region as well as knowledge of our own liberal past. And I think that David Kemp's work recently is very useful on history of liberalism in Australia. But I, th but I think we also need to investigate very closely what has gone on in the region and not, and not assume that there was nothing before our order. There was an order there, an order that may well still have some influence uh, and um, may help to explain why sometimes people behave in the region for instance, in Southeast Asia, a bit differently than we expected. A lot of Western analysts assume that when China got difficult in the South China Sea, the Americans would find a lot of Southeast Asian allies around them um, wanting to confront China. And it hasn't been that simple. Now, why not? That seems to me a very good question. Why not? Um, what, is it How helpful is it to look at past behavior to see why the Southeast Asians haven't behaved quite like we expected? 
Tony, we might take a question from our online participants. Uh, Andrew Farron uh, is returning to the question of uh, the United Nations and uh, okay. asking the question, uh, uh, would it be a nonsense for any uh, system separate from the United Nations, uh, for instance, an Asia-based system? Um, whatever the shortcomings of the UN, uh, it needs to be respected uh, via its concept of sovereignty. Yeah, I, I, of course I agree, Andrew. Um, but I must say, I'm, I'm very concerned that Australia engage at every level in this region. There could be nothing worse for us than to be a lonely uh, nation, it seems to me. Countries that are at odds with their region have very high defence expenditure, whatever. Uh, I think that we need to get involved in the conversations of this region. I think the conversation of the region, not a bad phrase for the way, the way the Asian region works. Perhaps Europe was once like that too, but not now. It's got its legal structures. Um, but we need to be involved in that conversation. Here's an opportunity for us to be so. We've got to say what sort of knowledge we need. I'm very worried in Australia at the, the decline in study of Asian languages, the decline in study of Asian histories the number of people who are um, thinking we can leave it to political scientists, um, international relations specialists. Uh, I mentioned Bilahari Kausikin before. He said that what was vital in his work running the foreign ministry of Singapore was a knowledge of history and philosophy. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, so I'm trying to emphasize those things. We really do have to get into that, uh, that area in the region to be engaged in the region, partly to think about what the West has done in the past. Um, uh, but partly to understand views there and how a rules-based order might develop there. So, of course, I agree about the United Nations, but there is a conversation going here. Let's be in it. Mm -hmm. Any further questions? Yes. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Will Scott. Just let us know who you are. Will Scott's um, my name. So, Tony, I'm drawn to this, um, what I guess I would describe as a positive revisionism model that you've outlined that embraces the kind of diversity of thought and history and cultural idiosyncrasies of our neighbours. My concern, however, is that that positive revisionism will come up against the negative revisionism of particularly authoritarian states like China, but also Iran, also Russia, who will abuse our willingness to be creative and to make compromises with other countries in order to exploit that, to push forward that kind of more single-minded view of the world. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an anxiety. Uh, it, it's interesting in the Council for Security Cooperation, the CSCAP organization, which has got uh, China, Russia, North Korea in it, as well as a whole lot of countries we think of as more friendly. Um, in the discussions, they're all willing to be engaged in this. Um, quite striking. You know, the Americans came to us because we were pushing for this with the Japanese and Singaporeans. The Americans said, look, we don't want to be leading this, but we think it's fantastic that you've got cooperation from everybody on this. We want to be there, but it's best that we keep our heads down. Um, and that made me think then that Australia generally perhaps has that role damaged somewhat if we are simply seen as a deputy sheriff, which is always a worrying exception. Um, but in order to make this discussion proceed, it seems to me we do have to have some knowledge of the history of the region, just as we have to have some knowledge of the history of early white uh, relations with Indigenous Australians. I mean, it matters that we have that knowledge. This is tricky stuff. It's tricky to talk about. There's no crisp views in here. I think it's very exploratory. But there are things we need to understand about why people behave as they do with foreign relations in Asia and where the limitations might be of using a uh, normal rules-based order and indeed our normal framework for international relations discipline to understand what's going on. Got time for another question, if anybody is interested. All right, Desmond, one, one quick one. Just more of a comment than a question in some ways. I think we took the view in the post-war world that modernity was necessarily ideological as well as material. 
by which I mean that inevitably, as you develop the appurtenances of uh, Western society, you would adopt the views of the Western world with regard to liberalism in particular. Having lived in Singapore, which is one of the most modern places on earth, and uh, spoken to many Singaporean friends, I realized that that ain't necessarily so, that the uh, Asian world has picked and chosen what it wants from the West, and materialism is obvious, uh, but not necessarily the underpinning uh, ideology that uh, grew that materialism in Europe and later in America. Uh, and that, I think, is going to the points that you've been making all evening about the differentiation between <coughs> how we think our Asian friends might perceive the world and how they really do. Yeah, if you go back 20 years, Governor Patton in Hong Kong had clear ideas about this, didn't he? He said that there was no doubt that with economic change that our values would come together and that uh, liberal democracy would thrive in China and everywhere else. Uh, and it hasn't worked out this way. And Singapore is a very good example of how some things have come, some things have taken, others have not. So it's quite useful to quote the former head of the Foreign Ministry, Bilahari Kalsik, about how ideas are going to be uh, fused together in many ways, rather than uh, old world being replaced by a new one. Uh, yeah, so that's our Gareth Evans, of course, 20 years ago, took the same line as, uh, as um, Governor Patton. But, um, Singapore has had one party in power since independence. Yeah. <laughs> the People's Action Party, known locally as the party that makes you pay and pay. Um, and uh, that is an example of what I'm talking about. I remember Gareth giving a great speech about how liberal democracy was flowing everywhere, everybody was speaking English, it's a convergence world. So there, was, there was great confidence about this. We're all uh, now look around, I was speaking to somebody in government recently telling me about the League of Democracies. And I said, Vietnam, not quite. You know, Laos, not quite. What about the Philippines? It's all well, okay. And he said, all right, we just use words like that. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. uh, Tony, we might uh, draw a line under it there. And um, thank you so much for uh, introducing the neighbourhood uh, view about uh, the uh, regional rules-based order, particularly with the uh, very important historical and cultural aspects. Look forward to your... Uh, <laughs> Before you run away, uh, we do have your fellowship award sitting right here. I have to prize it out carefully and gently. And if Alex has got a camera there, it might be good for a photo opportunity. No, not tonight. Okay, anyway. So anyway, on behalf of the Institute. Well, thank you. Well, using the self -defense. You can do a lot of damage. Yeah, well, that's it. We used to have this not sensitive.